Hi, I'm Derek, and this is DC to Daylight. In this video, we're going to take a closer look at the electromechanical relay, those clicky little switches that allow us to control high power devices from low power electronics like microcontrollers. Now, I've always wondered where the name relay originates, and I imagine that some of you also have the same question, so we'll dig into that for a couple of minutes. Then we'll take a look at special considerations for driving a relay from a microcontroller pin or a TTL logic device. Those considerations include making sure we have enough current to switch the relay on, as well as protecting the semiconductor device from damage due to high voltage inductive kickback when turning the relay off. I also want to say that I have an ongoing list of ideas for these videos, but I'd like to hear from you. What would you like to delve into on this channel? We could cover biasing transistors, more radio frequency content, or just a burning question maybe, like I've seen this circuit on every schematic, what does it actually do? Let me know in the comments or hit me up in the community at element14.com. The links are in the description. Let's get started. As we already mentioned, a relay is a kind of electromechanical switch that allows us to complete or interrupt another circuit that we're unable to safely control with something like a microcontroller output port. This could mean that we're trying to control a high power motor, light, or in the case of radio frequencies, switching a signal into and out of a circuit. Whatever the case may be, the construction of a relay is generally the same across the board. There are a set of two or more contacts, at least one will be normally open, and there can be one or more additional sets of contacts which make contact when the relay is energized. The bit that actually moves and makes electrical connection between the contacts is called the armature. The armature will usually be composed of a ferrous material that is attracted to magnets. Though sometimes the armature is non-magnetic and in that case will have a ferrous slug welded to it. In the relay's unenergized state, there's a spring that holds the armature to the normally closed side or NC side of the circuit. The electrical device that actuates the armature into contact with the normally open or NO contact is the electromagnet. Now just like a regular old toggle switch or push button, relays come in a wide variety of configurations. SPST or single pole single throw, meaning having a single armature and single normally open contact. SPDT or single pole double throw having one armature and two sets of contacts. We can also have multiple armatures that are physically linked but electrically isolated like an example of a DPDT relay, or dual pole dual throw, meaning two armatures and two sets of contacts. Then if we want to add more than two armatures and contacts, the terminology changes to 3P, 3T, 4P, 4T, and so on and so forth. Beyond that, we're getting to some specialized circuitry that won't necessarily be covered here today. Let's just keep it simple. So here we have kind of a mock-up of a telegraph station from the mid-1800s. Of course, you're familiar with Samuel Morse who developed the Morse code. He also worked alongside Alfred Vail. Now, Alfred Vail is credited with the invention of the straight key, which this is a more complicated variant of, but it's essentially just a switch. So we have at a telegraph station, typically a set of chemical batteries. We have a Morse code key that completes a circuit when you press the key down and each telegraph station would have a sounder. Now a sounder is just a set of electromagnets that pulls down on an armature to make a noise. And each telegraph station was able to communicate with each other over a telegraph line. Okay, we'll look a little bit more about that in a second. Because of the resistance of the wire, you could only send messages over a certain amount of distance. So in order to send a message over really long distances, you would have to have one station, a station in between, that would listen to the message and retransmit it with another set of batteries to that station that's further away. So that person in that intermediate station would listen to the message, then he would write it down, and then you would have to retransmit that message to the third station. Imagine having that job. I don't know, it sounds kind of boring to me. So it didn't take long to figure out that that intermediate person could be replaced by an electromechanical device that could automatically relay the message for you. So was born the relay. So we have uh, an electromagnet that actuates an armature that makes contact uh, to a set of terminals. So this would be put in series with the existing circuit and then we could retransmit this with another battery bank across these terminals that are connected back to the telegraph line going to that third station. This is a little more typical of an actual real world setup. Um, we've got our little western town here, we've got our telegraph lines going from station A to B to C. So we have a local battery bank at station A we can complete the circuit through the telegraph line back to our relay. 
Okay, so we're energizing this electromagnet by pressing our key. That in turn actuates these contacts on the relay, which is part of a separate battery bank at station B. Okay, that signal is retransmitted immediately or relayed from station B to C over the telegraph line and actuates this relay at station C. What's interesting and probably a topic for another video is they actually use a single telegraph line and the return path was through the actual ground, which is interesting. But that's essentially where the relay comes from. Let's talk about what it takes to drive a relay from a microcontroller pin. Now, some microcontrollers offer up to 40 milliamps of drive current, which will probably allow you to drive a certain range of relays uh, without using a buffer transistor, okay? But we're gonna cover if we don't have enough current, which, you know, in a couple of weeks, this is exactly the case we're gonna run into, where we only have like 20 milliamps of drive current from the GPIO pin, and we wanna drive it and buffer it with a transistor to give it more current gain. So in that case, we have an NPN transistor with the emitter connected directly to ground, and the collector connected to the coil, coil connected to our positive supply, which is gonna be 12 volts. Now we have this, what's called a freewheeling diode that protects the transistor uh, when you de-energize this coil. Okay, we'll talk about that a little bit more in a minute. But we need to make sure that we drive the transistor with enough current to supply enough current to the coil. Okay, so this guy acts as a buffer, okay, giving it more current uh, drive capability. So the first step in putting a relay in your circuit is going to be obviously to select the relay based on the coil voltage, all right? So these are always specified based on the voltage you're gonna to supply to it. Uh, and the contact rating, these guys here, the thing you're gonna switch, is it AC, is it DC? What's my maximum voltage and current rating that these guys are going to see? And you're gonna to have to shop around, so that's the fun part. The particular relay that I'm gonna be using has a coil voltage of 12 volts DC, and it has a coil resistance specified in the data sheet of 720 ohms. Now sometimes the data sheet will explicitly specify the amount of current required here, but you can use Ohm's law to figure it out. So the collector current required is VCC divided by your coil resistance, or in our case, 12 volts divided by 720 ohms, which is 16.7 milliamps. So we have to put 16.7 milliamps at least in this uh, coil to actuate the armature. So now that we know that, we need to figure out how much current we need to put through the base to give that coil enough juice to actually switch. Now there's a parameter called our DC HFE, our DC beta, okay? And that comes from the data sheet of the transistor. And that's pretty much the wild west. And the reason for that is process variation in manufacturing, okay? So they can't really tightly control uniformity of beta or the current gain across the entire wafer when they're manufacturing these things. So for the 3904, the particular one I'm looking at is ranging from 100 or 300. That means whatever I put into the base is gonna be multiplied by 100 or 300. You know, we don't really know. So we're gonna take the minimum value of that, okay, and do the rest of our calculations. So my base current, if I use that 100 for beta, is going to be my collector current divided by my beta, which is also called HFE, which is 16.7 milliamps divided by the 100 for beta. That comes out to 167 microamps. So I only need to give 167 microamps to get 16.7 milliamps out of the transistor. So you can see why there's an advantage in doing this. So what's my base resistor going to be? Well, I take my voltage in, which is gonna be five volts from let's say an Arduino or some TTL logic, and I divide that by my required base current. So five volts divided by 167 microamps is approximately 30K, 30 kilo ohms. Now I personally like to go one value down, which increases my current a little bit. Okay, so I'm actually gonna try using a 22K resistor and uh, we'll put it on the breadboard over there and this guy should switch fine. And then we'll look at uh, why this snubber diode is required. Here's our circuit from the schematic. Uh, I'm gonna go ahead and use a 30K base resistor just to show you that it does actually work. Although in practice, I would go to the next standard value resistor down to increase my current a little bit more. Uh, we have our 3904 transistor, our NPN transistor here. Emitter is connected to ground, and of course that resistor is going to the base, which is our center pin. The collector goes to the uh, one side of the uh, relays coil, and the other side of that coil goes to our positive 12 volt rail. Now you can see we have our freewheeling or flywheel diode across um, the coil. What happens when you energize this coil is we get uh, a magnetic field around that coil, okay? When we disconnect power, 
uh, that field collapses, which induces a current in the coil, which can produce, which will produce a back EMF. Okay, so it's enough to eventually damage that transistor. So this guy is pretty much always a requirement. It's good design practice. Um, and then on the output between the two contacts, normally open contacts, I just have a resistor and an LED to show that it is operating. So let's apply five volts. And there you have it. Relay action. So let's go over to the scope and look at why this diode is actually required. All right, so instead of keeping my relay in circuit, I thought I'd pull it out and we could just, I could show you more clearly what I'm doing. So I'm across the coils uh, with my oscilloscope probe and my probe is actually dividing the voltage by 10. So we'll have 10 volts per division, but we're actually seeing is 100 volts per division. Um, so what I'm gonna do is I'm going to energize the coil momentarily and then I'll pull off and you can see what the what the trace actually looks like. So let's go over to the scope. All right, and we'll uh, put it into single shot mode. See what we're looking at here. Remember that this is 100 volts per division. Let me zoom in and uh, we'll scoot it over a little bit. So we have 100, 200, 300, almost 400 volts um, of uh, voltage when that field collapses that's attached to our transistor. Now I'm going to put the diode on and we'll see what that looks like again. All right, I've uh, soldered the diode in there. And when I disconnect my power from the circuit, that field collapses. And what's actually happening is uh, the field collapses, that voltage is induced, and the current actually circulates between the diode and the coil until it dissipates. Now I've removed the divide by 10 probe and I'm using a standard probe uh, because really this diode's doing its job and I couldn't even read the, read the uh, voltage spike. So let's take a look at what's actually happening now. And now when I connect power and disconnect it, nothing. There's basically no voltage spike now when it goes negative. Okay, so that diode's doing its job. That field collapses, circulates in that uh, between the diode and the coil and the transistor is now safe. The point is always install your freewheeling diode. All right, well, that's it for this episode. Thanks for hanging out and talking about the theory of uh, turning relays on and off. So I know that everybody doesn't do things the same way. Um, this is the preferred method that I use to select a resistor when driving a relay. So if you have a different method, I definitely want to hear about it. So put it down in the comments or engage with me and our team at element14.com. Links are all down in the description. Uh, oh, and before I forget, we have some circuit boards here. Uh, that we're going to put some relays on to do something cool. And I don't know if I should show this. It's a pretty big project. It's the largest circuit board that I've ever had manufactured. So come back and check it out next week. All right, that's it. Have a good one. See you.